Hello, everyone. Pastor Jerry here with our midweek Bible study. And I want you to open your Bible, please, to the second book of the Scripture, that is to Exodus. We're in chapter 3. And if you remember, the people of Israel have been in Egypt now more than 400 years, and now God has decided it's time. You know, time to draw Israel kind of out of their cocoon, so to speak. Time to draw Israel out of Egypt. And today we read about the calling of Moses for service and about, of course, the burning bush. So we're in Exodus in chapter 3, and it says, Now Moses was pastoring the flock of Jethro, his father-in-law, the priest of Midian. We started, we ended there last time. And he led the flock to the west side or rear part of the wilderness and came to Horeb, the mountain of God. So the NASB here I'm in says it's the west side. It's uh, The New King James says it was the, the back side of the wilderness. What he's saying is that Moses is now, he's, pa- he's pasturing the flock in, you know, in a very remote area. Horeb, I think, stands for the whole mountain chain, and the specific mountain here he's talking about, this mountain of God would be Mount Sinai. So here's Moses after 40 years in Midian. We have him now ready to graduate, so to speak, from ministry school. I'll put it that way. He spent 40 years in the classrooms of Egypt, learning there the language, the culture of Egypt, becoming a man of learning. And now, 40 years, the second education, here in the desert wilderness of Midian, which brought to him learning of humility. See, this kind of helps explain what we need to happen for God to use us, really. Uh, Oftentimes people feel qualified for ministry because of their education, because of their experiences. But for God, that's only half, half of the preparation, really. Here's Moses. He's a shepherd as we see him. But notice, it's not even his flock. Is this Moses, a, a former prince of Egypt, humbled? Oh, man. Oh, yes, he is. Consider with me. In in Genesis 46, verses 33 and 34, it says, when Joseph uh, was preparing his brothers to go in and speak to the Pharaoh when they first came to Egypt, it says, and it shall come about when Pharaoh calls you and says, what is your occupation? You shall say, well, your servants have been keepers of livestock from our youth even until now, both we and our fathers, that you may live in the land of Goshen. For every shepherd is loathsome to the Egyptians. Moses is really an Egyptian in his raising. He's humbled. Ministry can humble you, folks. Um, God's preparing him. And so it says in Exodus 3, verse 2, And the angel of the Lord appeared to him in a blazing fire from the midst of a bush, and he looked... And behold, the bush was burning with fire, yet the bush was not consumed. Wow, consider, you know, as Israel was not consumed by the furnace of affliction there in Egypt, so also this bush was not consumed by the flame. Um, Why? God was present there. You know, people, with all that's happening to us in the United States and around the world today, in our nation, in in our fellowship, God is at work, and God is working out his purposes, but we're not going to be consumed by the fire. Just hang in there. We just have to endure and walk with God. So Moses said, I must turn aside now, see this marvelous sight, why this bush is not consumed, burned up. And when the Lord saw that he turned aside to look, God called to him from the midst of the bush and said, Moses, Moses. And he said, here I am. Notice, Moses, or rather, God wants Moses to see, to, to wait, and he's, he's looking to see if Moses will respond. So God wants to see if Moses will respond, that's what I meant to say. And then when he does respond, then comes the call. See, often, you know, we read God's word and it doesn't really, God, it just doesn't, Touch our heart. Oh, why is that? We're not giving it our full attention. We're not observing what it's declaring. If we observe, if we pay attention, you know, when we read the Word of God, God can show us many amazing things, you know. God speaks through His Word, folks. Um, in, in James, the, the book of 
the, the New Testament book of James there, this is what it declares concerning this issue. In James chapter 1, verse 22, it says, But prove yourselves doers of the word, and not merely hearers who delude themselves. For if anyone is a hearer of the word and not a doer, he is like a man who looks at his natural face in a mirror, and for once he has looked at himself and gone away, he has immediately forgotten what kind of person he was. But one who looks intently at the perfect law, at God's word, the law of liberty, and abides by it, not having become a forgetful hearer, but an effectual doer, this man literally shall be blessed in what he does. God just makes it real. God's word comes alive. And the Lord waited. What's Moses going to do? When Moses turned aside, God made the call. Verse 5. Then he said, do not come near here. Remove your sandals from your feet, for the place in which you are standing is holy ground. So God instructing him here about reverence. You know, keep your respectable distance there, Moses. Take off your sandals. You know, this is holy ground. This is a place worthy of honor. The Lord is here. You know, I think um, that application comes where we can become kind of casual with God. Uh, we can become casual with his word. We can become actually to, to the point of almost being disrespectful, if not disrespectful. Yes, God does love us, and truly, because of the work of the cross, we can walk boldly in the very throne room of God's grace. However, our God is holy, <laughs> and he's awesome in power. Yes, we dress casually here at Calvary Chapel, um, but we're serious about God's word. We're serious about the Lord himself and about his spirit. You know, So we need to be showing respect at all times for God and his word. There should be, actually, at every service, there should be a minimum of distractions. You know, people getting up, I need to get a drink of water. I need, you know, take care of those things before the service starts. You know, we need to learn, folks, to be respectful. We need to respect because our God is holy. He is a holy God. So verse 6, he said also, I am the God of your father. The God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, the God of Moses, excuse me, the God of Jacob. Then Moses hid his face, for he was afraid to look at God, which is kind of a wise, humble response there. I want you to notice here, or did you, the use of the word in the present tense there, I am. I am the God of your father, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, the God of Jacob, you know. God's the God of the, of the living you know, more than 600 years have passed since the time of Abraham, and yet the Lord is still God. So our God is outside of time. Our God is eternal. We have an eternal God. And the Lord said, I have surely seen the affliction of my people who are in Egypt and have given heed to their cry because of their taskmasters, for I am aware of their suffering. So God knows, he sees, he cares. So I have come down to deliver from the power of the Egyptians and to bring them up from the land to a good, spacious land, to a land flowing with milk and honey, to the place of the Canaanite, of the Hittite, of the Amorite, the Perizzite, of the Hivite, and the Jebusite. I mean, now, this is kind of, a, of utmost importance, I think, for us to see here, that God delivers from, and then he takes us to. God doesn't just deliver and then just kind of walk away and forget about us, you know. See, God took us out of death and he brought us to life. God brought us out of darkness and into the light, you know. We can put it that way. If you are saved today, you are completely saved. He didn't just deliver you from evil, deliver you from demons, and then leave you alone unprotected. No, he gave us his spirit. So God does a complete work, folks. He didn't, you know, he, he won't just leave us. God is going to take Israel out of their slavery and then lead them into the land of promise. That's how our God operates. He's the same God today. So verse 9, and now behold, the cry of the sons of Israel has come to me. 
Furthermore, I have seen the oppression which the Egyptians are oppressing them. So God sees oppression. He sees it all. Therefore, come now, and I will send you to Pharaoh, so that you may bring my people, the sons of Israel, out of Egypt. So here is that literal calling of Moses. I will send you that you may bring my people out, you know. But Moses said to God, who am I that I should go to Pharaoh and that I should bring the sons of Israel out of Egypt, you know? Now, now this is actually a changed Moses. If you remember last time we read from Acts chapter 7 there, verse 25, it was um, in the last few, the last words of Stephen, the first martyr of the church. And he said, Moses kind of, supposed that his brethren understood that God was granting them deliverance through him. But now he says, who am I? Who am I to do this, Lord? Now, after 40 years in this Midian desert, he's humble. Now that Moses is out of the way, so to speak, let me put it that way, God now can use him. See, that's what has to happen with us to be used. We can't be filled with ourself. We have to be empty of ourself and filled with him, filled with the spirit for God to use us. You know, there was an old uh, Puritan kind of quotation or kind of a their own proverb or axiom that said, the same sun that melts the wax hardens the clay. Moses here, under the 40 years of the Midian sun in that burning wilderness, has been refashioned by God. He's been molded into a vessel that can now be used of God, you see. People, we need to allow the Holy Spirit to shape, to bend, uh, mold us. We need to allow God's, to, to God's Spirit to, to make the necessary change in the, changes that we need to be made in our lives if we want to be used by him. We can't allow ourselves to say, oh, no, I just, I don't do that. I, I never do that. Or, oh, that's not who I am. I never. No. Listen, if you want to be used by God, then you must, you must allow the Lord to use you. And that happens by only by surrendering to his spirit and his spirit's work in you. We have to be shaped. We are new creatures in Christ. We have to submit to that change that must occur well verse 12 and he said certainly i will be with you said the lord and this shall be the sign to you that it is i who has sent you when you have brought the people out of egypt you shall worship god at this mountain here's your sign you're gonna you're gonna worship here at sinai now some people here Here, rather, here is the assurance that Moses needed, I think. When we know that we are, that we have uh, the one true God with us, when we know that we have the one true God let's say, in, on, our, on our side, then no matter what God has assigned us to do, we can step forward with confidence and then do his will. See, that is the solution to a heart that wavers. Having God with us when we do the ministry work, man, that's the whole difference, the, all the difference. For Moses, this is a huge assignment. Think about it, to bring two or three million people out of slavery, cross over a desert to this mountain of God. He couldn't do it. He couldn't do it. Man could not do that. He had to be filled with God. God had to be using him. So it says in 13, then Moses said to God, behold, I'm going to the sons of Israel, and I shall say to them, the God of your father has sent me to you. Now, they're gonna, they may say to me, what is his name? What shall I say to them? See, he, Moses here anticipates the questioning, you know, that's going to happen when they, when they will be asking. And, and rightfully, Moses is, is going to say, I need some kind of credentials so, so that they might believe me when I, when I speak. And God said to Moses, verse 14, I am who I am. And he said, thus you shall say to the sons of Israel, I am has sent me to you. See, generally people assume this is the full name of God, but really it's, it's a very deep statement about, well, about our God's nature. It, it's what the Jews call the tetragrammaton. It's that four-letter word that uh, for the biblical name 
of the God of Israel. Uh, we, we pronounce it Yahweh or, or Jehovah. But in reality, I am who I am is, is in the continuous present tense. It's not I was. It's not I will be. God always is always in the present tense. God's saying, I have no beginning. I have no end. God is. There has never been a time when God was not. There will not be ever a time when God will cease. God says, I am the eternally self-existent one. Wow. God relies on nothing to live. God relies on nothing to exist. He's giving a picture of God, of who he is, his nature. In John's gospel, we kind of have a hint of this in the beginning verses of John chapter 1. John wrote, in the beginning was the word, and the word was with God, and the word was God. He was in the beginning with God. All things came into being by him, and apart from him, nothing came into being that has come into being kind of expresses this whole idea of the eternal self-existent one. Well, verse 15, And God furthermore said to Moses, Thus you shall say to the sons of Israel, The Lord, the God of your fathers, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, God of Jacob has sent me to you. This is my name forever, and this is my memorial name to all generations. This I am God now declares, you know, I am the God who appeared to Abraham and and Isaac and Jacob. I'm the same God. Go and gather the elders of Israel together. Say to them, the Lord, the God of your fathers, the God of Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, has appeared to me saying, I am indeed concerned about you and what has been done to you in Egypt. So I said, I will bring you up out of the affliction of Egypt to the land of the Canaanite and the Hivite and the Amorite and the Perizzite and the Hivite and the Jebusite to a land flowing with milk and honey, and they will pay heed to what you say. So God says, Moses, tell Israel, the God of who, who made promises to Abraham and Isaac and Jacob, that same God will now bring you to a land flowing with milk and honey. And he says, and you... With the elders of Israel will come to the king of Egypt, and you will say, you will say to him, The Lord, the God of the Hebrews, has met with us. So now, please, let us go a three days journey into the wilderness that we may sacrifice to the Lord our God. But I know that the king of Egypt will not permit you to go except under compulsion. So here we kind of see the uh, the foreknowledge of God. So I will stretch out my hand and strike Egypt with all my miracles, which I shall do in the midst of it. And after that, he will let you go. So God gives kind of a brief brief synopsis of what is about to occur, what will occur. And I will grant this people favor in the sight of the Egyptians, and it shall be that when you go, you will not go empty-handed. So here the Lord gives this prophecy about What's going to happen in order to, I think, entice the Jewish elders to listen to Moses? But every woman, verse 22, shall ask of her neighbor and the woman who lives in her house articles of silver, articles of gold, and clothing, and you will put them on your sons and daughters. Thus you shall, or you will, plunder the Egyptians. Wow. Thus you will plunder the Egyptians. Now, in Exodus chapter 12, verses 35 and 36, this is what we read. Now the sons of Israel had done according to the word of Moses. For they had requested from the Egyptians articles of silver, articles of gold and clothing. And the Lord had given the people favor in the sight of the Egyptians so that they let them have their request. Thus they plundered the Egyptians. Wow. So Israel does not leave empty-handed. It it all comes to pass, as the Lord declared, you know. They are paid, basically, for their years of slave labor. See, there are no slaves in the kingdom of God. God arranges it so that true 
justice prevails. For the worker is worthy of his hire. That's what it says in the New Testament. For anyone who feels he has been slighted, anyone who feels he's been cheated, again, understand, our God will bring about a full payment. Our God is a just God. We serve a mighty God, a righteous God, a just God. So this assignment of Moses is laid out for him in three stages, isn't it? One, getting the people to follow Moses. That's the first job. Second phase, getting the people of Egypt to let them go. And third, getting the entire nation of Israel into the land of promise. And you're thinking, impossible. Well, for Moses, yes, but not for God. See, the rest of this story is actually the remainder of the book of Exodus. So today we see the calling to service of Moses. And um, our God is the same God. He's the same yesterday, today, and forever. This is how our God leads. He doesn't lead us and then leave us alone abandoned. I will not leave you as orphans, said Jesus. This is a great encouragement to us. Our God is the God who is self-existent, the God who is always in the present tense, I am. He's the same every day. James says, without shifting shadow, God doesn't have his moody days. Our God is the same forever. Praise the Lord. So we can read his word and be totally secure in what it declares. And it offers us hope and at the same time the peace that passes all understanding. Thank you, Lord, for your word. I hope this uh, short study here in chapter 3 of Exodus uh, helps you this week. Extract from it the tools that you need uh, for your day, for the days ahead. Let's just end with a word of prayer. Heavenly Father, I thank you for this time. I thank you, Lord, that your word is powerful. Lord, that your word prepares our hearts and assures our hearts. And that, Lord, your word is truth. Lord, thank you that we can go to you and you speak to us out of your word as we take the time to consider and as we look at it. Lord, thank you for being a gracious God. Thank you for caring about us as we see here. Thank you for going before us. Thank you for your prophecy that tells us how things will occur. Thank you, Lord, for all that you do. Bless your people. Give them a great week. Lord, in these times of uncertainty, Lord, I pray your peace would descend upon us, Lord. As the Lord has declared in that ironic blessing, the Lord bless thee, keep thee. The Lord make his face to shine upon thee and be gracious unto thee. Have a wonderful day. God bless you.